Welcome back, everyone, to Crime and Entertainment. I am your host, Hollywood Wade. Now, I have here a man that needs no damn introduction at all. He's got over 240 films up under his belt. Just a few of these films, we're talking box, off num box office numbers over $2 billion. That's with a motherfucking B, folks. This is none other than Tom size more tom how you doing pal i'm good man i'm good i'm good wait how you doing man i'm fantastic we are glad to have you on the show we've been trying to put this together for a little bit and i'm glad we could get it done me too look your resume of movies is is second to none i don't really to me i, I know there was a game a while back that was popular it was called like the six degrees of kevin bacon where you'd work with so many people you can name an actor, and then within six movies, you could relate it back to him. That needs to be a six degrees of Tom Sizemore, because you've worked with, I mean, just the, the heavyweights of Hollywood, man. I mean, there's not too many people you haven't worked with. There's Bob De Niro, Val Kilmer, Denzel Washington, Tom Hanks. I mean, Vin Diesel, the list goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, it does. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been great, man. It's been great. It's been a great ride. Um, I've enjoyed it. And I'm, I still love doing it too. I, it, it's second to none for sure. Like we said earlier, but now I guess let's start from the beginning here. Where did you grow up as a youngster? Um, I was born in uh, Detroit city, um, um, in a place called Cork town, which is inside Detroit. It's a little enclave down by the original tiger stadium. Um, and I, I lived there and then we moved to the east side of Detroit when I was four into a flat when my grandparents were downstairs and we were upstairs and it was myself, my, my mom and my dad and my, my brother, Aaron, and the family grew from there. Um, I lived in Detroit until I was uh, 17. And um, then I went to college and um, I was in Detroit. I went, to, I went to Michigan State for a year. And then I went to um, Wayne State University. We had a really great theater program. Mm -hmm. I, I decided I wanted to be an actor when I was in, um, when I was in high school. And um, I was lucky they had a, a, a college there called Wayne State University, which had in the um, 70s, 80s, and, and it's still a strong program. They had one of the better undergraduate acting theater programs in the country. Mm -hmm. So I went to, I went to Wayne and um, I did really well there. And um, I left Detroit when I was 20, 20, just turned 21. And I moved to um, Philadelphia and I went to Temple University and got my master's. Um, Back then, there was this thing called um, the PATP, um, the Professional Actor Training Programs. And that was Yale, Juilliard, Temple, um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, University of Washington, Seattle, um, a bunch of schools, 12 of them, 12 schools, 12 mm -hmm. of these schools. And it started with um, a guy named Robert Brewstein, who used to teach it at Harvard. And he went to Yale and he started this PATP. And it was he was trying to train the new American actor. And a great model of it was like Meryl Streep and William Hurt. They were graduates of one from Juilliard, one from Yale. Meryl went to Yale. Hurt went to Juilliard. And he was trying to train the American actor to be able to do Shakespeare and do kitchen sink drama, what we call, what we see now. You watch Breaking Bad or, you know, right. any kind of like what we go to the movies to see. That would be your um, kitchen sink drama. And um, <clears throat> simultaneously, he wanted to train, train any, and they did do this at these schools train an actor, the American actor to be able to do Shakespeare um, to a house of like 2000. So um, there are real serious programs and Temple was one of the stronger ones. And uh, from there I went, I moved to New York. You know, I was in New York at 20, 23. Wow. Now I don't want to gloss over this before we get on to your movie career, but you were a hell of an athlete in your day, right? Yeah, I, I was good. I was good. <laughs> I wish I were bigger. Um, um, yeah, I, I was um, I was a really good football player and a, a really good basketball player. Yeah. Um, I would have liked to have been, if I'd have had the, if I'd have had the talent, I would have liked to have been a pro football player. That was what I want. I really wanted to be that until I was um, fifteen, and it was in my end of my sophomore year, junior year, I realized I wasn't going to be an NFL quarterback, and it was it was tough to handle. Yeah. Because I really, I really thought I was going to be one. I was really good at it, but um when I got to high school and then we started playing schools, um, you know, around Michigan and in Ohio, there was just, there was just guys that were, you know, bigger and 
and better than me. And I wasn't going to get any bigger, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And did you, the kids did you these days, I did. I did. I played football in high school and I'm about like you. I was kind of not blessed in the size department. So there was right. kids were a lot, lot bigger than me. And I knew it was for me, it was just fun. There wasn't going to be a career after that. Yeah. Um, my son plays youth football right now. And last year he was on the 12 U squad. So they have two age groups per, per section. So you got 11 and 12 year olds on this team. There was a 12 year old kid. I shit you not. That kid was six, five and weighed 240 pounds. For real? Yes. Did and he, he move? Was, oh yes. Yes. He could move. He got called for so many face mask and penalties when he wasn't trying to, but it just, as soon as he comes up and he goes forward, his arm is level with most kids' head. So it was they would constantly have to call face mask penalties on him, but he didn't mean to. He wasn't doing it. He just he couldn't help it. He's twelve years old? He's that big. He, well, he was he turned thirteen in December. So our season started in like August. So it ran usually through the end of November. Well, he turned thirteen in December. So for the whole year he was still technically twelve years old. What position does he play? Offensive lineman and defensive end. They kind of they bounce them both ways at that uh at that age groups, but now he's playing for his high school. I think on his uh JV team, and I'm pretty sure they still have him at lineman. But he he'll probably play lineman lineman or defensive end. Either one. He's a big kid. Is he talented? He is talented. He's got raw talent. He don't even realize how strong he is. We had some of the adults go after him uh, out there, like they would line up and put pads on him. I mean, he was picking up grown men and just slinging them like nobody's business. Moving them. Yeah, moving him. Like, it was hard for him to practice normal because he had the ability to hurt some of these kids, like legitimately hurt them if he wanted to. So it was hard for him to practice full out to get his full potential because if he'd done it in practice, he could legitimately hurt some of these smaller kids. So it was, you almost had to tell him to tone it down, which in turn, I think, hindered his, you know, development as a player. Um, what position does your son play? Uh, tight end. Tight end? Yeah. That's in the pros, man. Yeah. You want to, that's the position. Yeah, if he can get a little height on him, man, that's a, that's something he can get. He, he's got the hands. He just ain't got the speed. So that's where he's at. But as long as he can catch that ball and block, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, yeah. If he can block and catch the ball, he can play in the pros. Yeah. yeah. He can. Yeah. Will just Seattle, I mean, he has no wheels. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Seattle's tight end. Yeah, for sure. Will Dissel is. Will Dissel. Yeah. You don't meet many guys know Will Dussel is. No. No, I, I well, I'm a bit as we talked earlier before we got on, I'm a huge football guy, so I know I know all the tight ends, I know everybody that plays all the positions. I'm a big studier of the game. Um yeah, me. you know, from college all the way up. I follow a lot of these guys from college. And so when they get there, I'll I'll tell my son, like if he's playing a new Madden game, I'll be like, Oh, well, that guy came from this school and he played this position and you know, I try to uh-huh. coach him up the right way. <laughs> Did you see Dick coming? Was that? Did you see Derrick Henry's career coming? No, I did not. I didn't either. I did. And just based on what other Alabama running backs had done until he got there, which is nothing. Yeah, I mean, Mar- Mark Ingram, I guess, had a career of longevity, not necessarily a career of you know highlights and accolades. But no, I did not see Derrick Henry's career coming at all. Nope. And he's he's the best back in a long time. Yes. I mean, just for that size and can move like he moves, it's just this. I haven't seen anything like it. You might have to go back to, I mean, you might have to, Earl Campbell days or something along the lines of, man, I, I don't even know if that's, that's probably the best Earl, comparison. Jim Brown. Yeah. I Jim. Mean, yeah. You got to go of, back a minute. That kind of size, speed. <clears throat> you, can't, you can't catch him. No. Yeah, if he, I think it was, who was that they was playing? It was the Chiefs. They were playing last week. And I mean, he got, he got down the sideline, and I mean, it was just, it was lights. Nobody could catch him. <laughs> no. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, I, 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 in high school, um, I was, um, I was an athlete, and then, um, <clears throat> I got a girlfriend, my first serious girlfriend when I was a, 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 a into my junior, into my sophomore year, and then there was, um, it, we did plays there. We did, we did the, um, the, um, we did two plays. We did this Christmas play, and then we did the end of this school year play. And, and um, <clears throat> I, I sang. I, I was in the, I was in the chorus in the choir in grade school and, and in middle school. And then I got out of it. By the time I got to high school, I was just focusing on football. And um, 
<clears throat> and she was in the play in my my junior year, and um, we were a couple, and they did a they did um Oklahoma, and the guy who played the lead in Oklahoma, I went to see the play, and I and I said to her, I was a little jealous of the guy, and I, I said I could out sing that fucking guy, and um, she said it's not, it's not as easy as you think, Tom, and I said oh I, I could do that shit, man. His name was Mike. I don't want to tell you his last name, but um he, he was kind of talented too, you know, so. I got into my head that I was going to go out for the play. Um, the next time you could go out for a play and it was the music man. And I auditioned for it. And I, 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 I got, I got the lead and, um, and I, I was, I've been hooked ever since. Yeah. I had no idea that I was going to fall for it. Like I fell for it. Wow. And it was the whole idea of, um, it was just, it just kind of blew my mind, you know, that I, I was this jock guy. And then based on this kind of like comment I made to my girlfriend and her kind of daring me to go out for the play. And, but secretly I kind of harbored, like I could do what this guy did and it looked like a lot of fun, but then it was just this, 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 these pages of, you know, ink on a page, you know, it was this musical. And then to see how far we went in seven weeks, it just kind of blew me away and it, right. it was really good. And the way we all came together as a, as a, as a, as an ensemble and a group. And it also, it kind of reminded me of, of, of football in a way. You know, you 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 you, have, you go to start playing in August, and you start yeah. rehearsing to play, and you work on the your plays. That's your big song and dance numbers, mm -hmm. and then you, you Friday night, you know, September second, and it's opening night, or you know, it's the first game of the season. So there there was certain things in it, certain aspects of it that reminded me of football that that I really liked, and you know, and you become kind of a, a the whole company becomes kind of um like a football team does its own society. Yeah, and. I really like that. I like that aspect of it. And, um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I decided, I decided, um, after that play, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see what I, I'm going to investigate this, you know? And I was trying to figure out how do you get from Detroit? How do you get in a movie? Yeah. I mean, how, how do you do this? And, um, and it became clear to me that you had, you had to do theater, you know, mm -hmm. I just did this play and it, you had to do, straight theater and not just musicals and you <clears throat> and serious serious actors went to new york or los angeles and um um i was real kind of naive you know i thought that hollywood actors or people that were in movies i thought they lived in hollywood or something they were from hollywood or like I, I was just naive you know i didn't yeah. know that james dean was from indiana <laughs> and i know i was from detroit and marlon brando was from omaha nebraska yeah. um you know i thought actors were from hollywood i just, I, I don't know I, I might have thought they were 35 feet tall. Like they were in the movies. I don't know. But, so I thought that. But um, I was kind of naive. And then I, I realized that this was, anyone could do this. You could come from any place. Mm -hmm. You know, just be, you know, a um, working class middle, working class kid from Detroit didn't disqualify me from pursuing this. And, um, and there were places to go study it that weren't necessarily in the middle of Manhattan or, or, no. or, or Hollywood. You could go study this in other places in this country that were really good and had, had, with the feeders to these big cities and these serious, these serious, um, serious plays and movies. And so, um, I did that, you know, I, 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 I saw what you had to do and I, and I had a lot of fun doing it too. I mean, I, I studied with a lot of great actors and a lot of great teachers and, um, it was just a lot of fun. Man. So when you were was doing that, was, were you in New York at the time when you were doing that? Was what? Were you in New York at the time when you were doing that? Were they in New York? Yeah. Um, well, initially I was in I was in college, uh -huh. and then when I moved to New York, um, I'd been studying acting for well three years in, in undergrad and three years at graduate school. But I <clears throat> I immediately got into a class in New York, the Sanford Meisner. You know, you ever Sanford Meisner? Mm -hmm. The Sanford Meisner. I, I was in his last class. You had to audition for it, and so um, and the, that was um, that was the beginning of my my you know, I guess serious, you know, more, you know, I was going to do this for a living. Right. I, I was, I had um, committed to it emotionally and internally. Um, I didn't have a plan. Like I wasn't like um, one of these guys who, okay, I'm going to try to be an actor. I'm going to move to New York city or, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this until I'm 30 or, you know, and if it's not jumping off, if it's not jumping for me, I'm going to go to law school or I'm going to go do something else. I, um, <clears throat> I always thought that if you had a backup plan, that, that you'd do the backup plan. You know, yeah. that you were bound to have, you're bound to want something, want a job or and not get the job. 
get get discouraged. And that, that was part of what part of the, the training was to to learn how to deal with that. And um, I, I just I put all my eggs in that basket, and uh, it it um it went it, it went well, you know. And I, I I was able to to get where I wanted to get to. You know? Was there anybody? that was in those classes with you that was, you know, kind of up and comer at the time that, you know, made it like yourself or. Well, not in my class, but in, in the, in, in this, on the scene, you know, studying with various teachers, we all knew each other. Mm-hmm. Um, Anthony LaPaglia, Billy Baldwin, um, and uh, David Duchovny were the three guys that I, I saw and became friends with that we were young actors in New York city trying to, you know, trying to make it, trying to, trying to, you know, make it, you know, that's the, that's yeah. the term. <laughs> I, I, and they did. And, um, and I did too. Um, yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was pretty clear to me after, um, after I was in New York for a couple of years that, um, like I knew David was going places and I knew Billy, Alec was going places already, but I could tell Billy was going places too. Yeah. And, and Anthony was too. He did this play, he did this off Broadway play called bouncers. And, um, it's sep- people separated themselves pretty quickly there, you know. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it separates the wheat from it, not chaff, but you separate the wheat from the not so good wheat, I guess. Yeah. You know? Determined, maybe a bit better for yeah. now. Now, David, obviously, I know people are gonna, you know, relate him with X Files right off the bat, and that was a wonderful series. But you want to know a series of mine that I absolutely love that he did was Californication. I love That's Californication. One of my favorite shows of all time. <laughs> I'll rewatch that thing all the time, man. That's some funny shit, him and the, well, um, I can't remember the guy's name that was with him, the ball guy. Um, I can't remember his real name. It was Charlie in the show, but I can't yeah, remember yeah. his real name. He, he, they're fucking hilarious, man. Yeah, yeah David's <laughs> terrific, man. He's a terrific actor. He, he, you know, he's great. Um, yeah. So, um, the first movie I got was um. I was um was Blue Steel and Born the Fourth of July. I got them at the same time. Wow. Um, Oliver Stone was producing Blue Steel, and was directing Born the Fourth of July. So <clears throat> the same I auditioned for both both movies the same week, and uh, Catherine Bigelow was directing Blue Steel, and Oliver was producing it, and Oliver was directing um, Born the Fourth of July, and the first movie offer I got was was Born the Fourth of July. So it was kind of an auspicious beginning, even though. It was a small part, you know. It was um, I had three c- three scenes with Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. Um, I flew to the Philippines, and um, it just felt like, hey, I'm doing this. I, I've started doing this, and I'm I'm doing it, and it took off from there. Yeah, now, that's, that's definitely two good ones to come in to be your first two films. Now, Catherine Bigelow, what she was married to James Cameron, or is married, or was married? What was that? that- was. Was, was was. Job, yeah. Okay, yeah. So she's she's had a lot of hits up under her belt too, for sure. Hurt Locker. I did. I did. Um. I did three of her movies. I did Blue Steel, Point Break. I did an unbuilt cameo, and then Strange Days. Yeah. Which no one's really. Why? Why did you, Why did you get an unbuilt cameo in Point Break? Why was that? What? Why did you get an unbuilt cameo in Point Break? I was always curious. Oh, um, the part, where I was in my career, my agents. Or a CAA didn't think that the part was big enough, but I wanted to do it. You know, I wanted to do it. Yeah. So, I, so I just I wasn't built. I did an unbuilt cameo in um, um, Will Smith and me and uh, John Voight and um, Enemy of State. Enemy of State. Yeah, it's an unbuilt. Yeah. Now, Point Break. I mean, to me, I, I like Point Break, and that kind of set the tone for. I know it's a different world, but set the tone for like the Fast and the Furious is where you have the undercover guy infiltrating the gang and then kind of, you know, wanting to become a part of the gang as opposed to being a cop. I think that kind of laid the groundwork for a lot of those movies to come. But yeah, I remember that was like probably one of the first movies that I remember seeing you in coming up when I was watching these movies. I had seen Lock Up, you know, earlier on. My dad would rent, you know, all the Stallone movies. But Point Break was probably one of them I first seen you in. You you were the, what the you were undercover, right? And they busted in the house, and you was pissed because yeah. they busted in the house. I've been working these fuckers for three months. That's <laughs> <laughs> hey, me too. Yeah. You think? Here, my wife wants me to stay at the Ramada. Yeah. Uh, cool. How are they robbing Tarzani City National Bank on August second when they're in Fort Fucking Lauderdale August second? <laughs> you know it. I know. Hey, I know it by heart. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, that's a, that was a good one. Now you, you done Harley Davidson and the Marlboro man. How did you like that film? How did you, how did you, what was your experience like on that? Cause that was, that was, was that kind of more of your, more of a bigger role than you'd had at the time or. Um, hang on a second. You're starting to get your voice. It's, it's getting, I can't hear you right. It's starting to get, it's like it gets, it's breaking up or something. Okay. Is it better now? No. Uh oh. Well, there it goes. Okay. There it goes. Okay. Okay. So it's like you got from that mic. I don't know. It just started happening. Okay. I don't know. Maybe just filter here. Let's... Yeah. Maybe something more of that. All right. So. Holly Davis and Robo Man was, I did it because of Mickey. Mickey Rowe. I, mean, I wanted, I wanted to be. I wanted to work with Mickey Work, mm-hmm. and uh, it was um, it wasn't the greatest script, but um, you know, I wanted to work with Mickey Work. You know, that, that was why I did it. Yeah, I'd I'd read the reviews that you know it didn't maybe much, get the much better, much better way. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'd read the reviews that it wasn't you know I guess met with the best of uh, reviews by some of the critics, but it's one of those buddy buddy movies, man. You just want to watch me. Had Don Johnson and Mickey Rourke playing off each other and. I mean, I enjoy, it's one of those movies where if I'm scrolling through at night and it's on Cinemax or Showtime, I'm going to finish watching it no matter where it's at. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I always enjoyed it. Um, I, well, I'm a big Mickey Rourke fan too, especially a lot of his earlier stuff. You know, I enjoyed a lot of that. And Don Johnson, I mean, well, all you guys, hell. Um, now, after he, that, what did you, he, was it? Mickey still does great work, man. He just, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a weird world now. Movies, movies are strange and not like they used to be, you know, but, um. Well, even when he got older, the the roles that he took with like the wrestler and stuff like that, like wrestler was a fantastic film. I thought he did excellent in the wrestler. I love that performance. I love that movie. Yeah, he was I'm, he was just awesome. And what was the uh, was Sin City? I thought he was great in Sin City. I did too. Yeah, fantastic. So I mean, just you know, he's one of those guys been putting in that work for years. Darren Aronofsky directed the wrestler, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. He did. Yeah. He's he's my favorite director right now. Yeah. So my favorite young director, I guess. I mean, I love yeah. Um, now, when did Passenger Fifty Seven come along? That was after Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, right? Yep, yeah, right after it. It was um, nineteen ninety one. Uh, yeah, it was like a couple months after that. I I did I, I did Passenger Fifty Seven. Well, Passenger 57 with Wesley. Mm-hmm. Sly Del Vecchio. You like that movie? Sly Del Vecchio. That was your name, right? <laughs> huh? Sly Del Vecchio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's trying to, Wesley's trying to get him to get in contact with you. And the woman's like, can you spell that? And he's like, D E L Vecchio. Vecchio. I don't know. Vecchio. <laughs> Sly Del. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the big, the big, the big thing was after that, the, the big movie for me that really, I think my career was got real interesting for me was um, Natural Born Killers. Yeah, um, it was like a year after Pass- Passenger Fifty Seven. Yeah, um, I knew about the movie because Oliver and I got 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 close closer, or we got somewhat close on um and became friends on, on Born on the Fourth of July. Right, and um. It remained friendly, and uh, and I was fortunate enough to get in that movie, and that was um, that was just a great, a, a, a great, uh, a great experience, a great movie, and um, you know, then I then the really things opened up for me, you know, and that Dylan Blue Dress, Heat, uh, Saving Private Ryan, all you know, Black Hawk Down, they all came after that. That was yeah. uh, kick, kicked it over, you know, in a way. Yeah. Um- one of them I'll, I'll mention briefly before, because I want to talk about Natural Born Killers for a second. Uh, striking Distance that you did with Bruce Willis. Yes. What, what did you, did you like that film? Did you like doing that film? Yeah. I, I, that was one film. I watched it late one night. I remember one night I was up late and I was young at the time whenever it came out. But I remember trying to figure out who the hell was doing all that. And at the end of it, you know, that big, it was a great swing. So I would always watch that one whenever it was coming on. I think it was that, that song he kept playing, the little Red Riding Hood song that they kept yeah. playing at the end of it. I, I, I like that movie. Um, I too. But Natural Born Killers, man, that was another level of a movie, especially for me, because I was still, like I said, I was pretty young when that one came out too. But that was a Quentin Tarantino script, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, did he <laughs> sell that to Oliver? What? Is that did he sell that script to Oliver? Is that how that worked? Or no, he sold it to Don Murphy and Jane Hampshire. The producers, he, he sold he sold them True Romance and yes. Killers, and he kept Reservoir Dogs. He hadn't written Pulp Fiction yet. Right. <clears throat> he was still working at the at the video store then, and he kept Reservoir Dogs, and he did that with um, I forget his name. Um, it was Harvey, but the producer. But anyway, yeah, that that was the the first the first the first like five or six scripts Quentin wrote. Reservoir Dogs Killers was one of them, and um. Don and Murphy and Jane took it to Oliver and, and Oliver decided to direct it. Yeah. You can tell that his fingerprints are, are on that for sure. Was Scagnetti the only role that you put in for, for that movie? Did you, you know, put in for anything else or was that kind of what they had you in mind for? Um, I wanted to play Mickey, but it wasn't going to happen. But um, yeah, I was, um, for both of our dogs, I was it was me or Steve Buscemi for Mister um, Mister Pink. Mm -hmm. I read like eleven to fifteen times for Quentin. Wow! And uh, <clears throat> for Natural Born Killers, Oliver had me in mind for um, for Skagnetti from the jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you killed that role in Skagnetti. I watched. Matter of fact, earlier today I was watching, and I don't know if it still holds up, but is that like the longest walk and talk scene? In movie history? Yeah, with you and Tommy Lee Jones. The longest walk and talk in movie history. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some pretty good stuff, man. That was I mean, that was even at the time a little bit out of Tommy's uh I guess wheelhouse of what he was doing, the type of characters he was playing at that time, but all you guys just fucking nailed it. I mean, even Juliette Lewis, you know, I go from seeing her on Christmas vacation to fucking Mallory Knox. I mean, that was a hell of a difference. And then Woody you know, I'm used yeah. to seeing him playing in White Men Can't Jump, playing basketball with Wesley to, you know, over just killing up any and everybody. I mean, that was a fantastic movie. Was that probably one of your favorite movies you ever done? Yep. It's in the top it's in the top three or four. Yeah, I mean Robert Robert Downey Jr.'s in there as well, playing with Wayne Gale. I mean, that was You know it all. <laughs> y'all had some y'all had some top nut shit in there, man. That was some good stuff and just I watched that movie recently, not too long ago, because it's one of the movies that you can't quite grasp on one sitting. You, at least to me, you kind of got to watch it once or twice, and it gets better each time you watch it. You kind of bring it, it kind of sinks in more what he was doing with this and what he was doing with that, and the point he was trying to make. So that was that was some awesome stuff. Now mm -hmm. you did Devil in a Blue Dress. What was it like working with Denzel? Um. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, that was, um, I don't think about that movie as much as I, I probably should. Um, I don't know why. Um, but we had a lot of fun doing that movie. Uh, Denzel is a consummate fucking pro, bro. Yeah. I mean, he's the pro. And um, and Carl Franklin directed it. And uh, Denzel was, was a movie star. But <clears throat> I remember he got Crimson Tide on that movie. And... Um, his price went way up when he got Crimson Tide. I was I was in his trailer sitting with him when he got the call that he got the, the movie Crimson Tide and he was blown away at how much money they offered him. And um it was kind of the beginning of his like mature, I guess, superstar. Yeah. Um it, it was he, he was um we had a lot of fun, man. It was it was it was it was a great great experience and um you know it was a great script and um can't really go wrong with that. That one of Blue Dress was um that was right before Heat, and um, I got Captain Heat when we were doing the movie. It was a really, it was a really great time for me. Um, coming off of um, Dylan Bridges, I knew it was really good, and then and Heat was a real, a real serious endeavor. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <clears throat> we worked with the weapons. I, I had gone home. I'd gone home to Michigan for Christmas, and. Um, the day before Christmas Eve, December 23rd, Michael Mann called my dad's house. And my dad came, <clears throat> what room I was staying in, <clears throat> the new house. He'd remarried. <clears throat> and he said, Michael Mann's on the phone. And um, I'm like, really? And uh, when we got the phone, I was like, whoa, when was this? I thought I was, I was kind of nervous. Like, what the fuck's he calling me? And he said that um, the schedule changed and that they needed to um, start rehearsing 
what was going to be the shootout. I mean, the big scene and the robbery and stuff. Right. That we need to start doing that. If we were going to get the, um, Michael thought it, it needed uh, six weeks, <clears throat> six to eight weeks, six, 36 days of, um, of work before we start shooting. Yeah. <clears throat> and we were going to start, we we're going to start the day after Christmas. So <laughs> I'd gone home thinking I was going to be in, in Michigan through the third or fourth. So I had to get a plane and <clears throat> I flew back to LA on Christmas, Christmas um, day night. And uh, the following morning, I had to drive out to um, up by Magic Mountain over here in, in California. Um, it's where the, um, the, the sheriffs, <clears throat> LA sheriffs used to train, um, do, do, do their um, police academy. They weren't there anymore, but they'd been there till just recently. So they had all the, all the kind of shit, you know, houses and shit, you know, enter and stuff. Yeah. And you could you could train there. So <clears throat> I drove out there, and it was um, there was two trailers. There was one for Michael, and there was a trailer for Bob, Val, and me, and our our two trainers. <clears throat> and I met that. So I I met Bob. I met Bob. I knew Bob already. I, I did a movie with Bob called Guilty by Suspicion, something that was in there with the, those that period. <clears throat> and um, it's the one scene though with him in the movie. And um, but I knew I met Val, and uh, and then there was two 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 other guys there. And they ended up being two of the most decorated SAS men in history, the Secret Air Service, the Britain's um, CIA, Special Forces kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. We were part of it, right? Yeah. The SAS? Yeah. Mick Gould and Steve Mitchell. And um, Mitchell was a, is a living legend still. Yeah. Mick was very decorated. I never met him, I never met people like that before. So we met and they didn't tell us to tell us who they were. I mean, Bob knew, Michael knew. But in that first week, you know, they told they told Val and I who they were when we were training and stuff. And it was, um, I remember driving home after the, like the third day before New Year's and um, thinking like, the Steve Mitchell guy, there's any secret operations, you know, behind enemy lines and shit. He's been putting his life, life, in, life in harm's way since he was like 20 and um, a legendary killer. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't want to be quoted, I don't know, shouldn't say that, but there was an assassination of a world leader and I'm pretty sure he, he did it. Um, he didn't say he'd done it, but it, it came up in a conversation once. But he'd done all kinds of things, you know. Um, right. But this was a really serious thing Michael was doing to get this kind of, to, to go solicit this kind of guy to work on a movie and for this guy to agree to do it um, when he was still in the Secret Air Service. Mick was done with his, um, he'd done his 20. Steve was you know, I think he'd done his 20 and he was like 46 or something. So that training was real intense. It was real intensive training. You know, we got really good at those weapons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had experience with, with guns before. I mean, as a kid, you know, I, I didn't fuck with guns. Um, my grandfather hunted, hunted pheasant and stuff. And I went once when I was like eight or nine and I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the killing. Just watching the birds fall and shit. It wasn't for me. So, um, I didn't know much about guns, and when that was over, I could break down an AK. Uh, um, I could break down an um, AR-15, break it all the way down, and put it back together. Um, I could jam bullets, knew how to clear it, and keep rolling. And then the tactics they taught us—you know, you only saw a little bit of what they really taught us. I mean, they taught us we were really good. The three of us were really good, and that, that shootout. I mean, there's a lot of reason that shootout is so great in heat. Um, you know, the way it was put together. I mean, Michael, the sound, I mean, there was a full lows and the, the, the echoes and stuff. But if we hadn't been so proficient, well, we could have done that in our sleep, man. And moving up the street like that. Home. Yeah. And kill shots, only kill shots, um, counting your rounds. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Val does, a, Val does a magazine change that the Marine Corps, this is true five years ago, 
had, were using that as a using that in their training on magazine changes when Val was, bah, 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 you know, and um, they were counting them. He had 20, 20 rounds in it, and Val changed it at 19. And on every take, I know that, but you know, in the movie, you could, these, these freaky Marines had counted, it was 19. So they, they used, you know, we were that good at it that they used Val Kilmer's magazine change in that movie is to show young Marines. This is how you, this is how you change a mag magazine when you're in a firefight. Wow. This is how you do it. Like, just like this. And um, so, um, so I was I was driving home and I, I remember I, I didn't get, I got excited, but I got kind of nervous. Like, wow, this is a big thing, man. And these guys came all the way over here from Great Britain and Ireland to teach us actors how to do this. And, you know, it is just like a, a cops and robbers movie, you know, it's a, you know, um, but it's about, it's about a lot more than that. You know, it's right. about, about masculinity. It's about manhood. Um, it's about a lot of different things, you know? Um, yeah. And I'd read the script, you know, but Michael hadn't really finished the script. And I got the script in that six week period of training and I read the script and it was the greatest script I ever read in my life to this day. The, the stories he tells in the, in the movie, I mean, if you, you've seen, it's my favorite movie I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. Um, just as a viewer, he tells like all these stories. I mean, all the way down to the, 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 the driver, you know, yeah. he, his girlfriend and the parole officer and all this shit. And, um, I was just blown away by Michael's, uh, Michael Mann's writing, his ability to spin these stories in his screenplay. I'd read some good screenplays at that point. I'd read Reservoir Dogs. I'd read Pulp Fiction. I'd read True Romance. I'd read Natural Born Killers. Um, I'd asked Oliver for Platoon. I'd read Platoon. Um, and uh, those were all great screenplays. And they were all, but he was just like a little notch above it, I thought. You know, like just his ability to tell so many human stories and, and keep you interested in these people for so long, you know? Yeah, that's, it's definitely one of my favorite movies. I guess. You, it's hard to put that one in a certain kind of class. I don't know if it would go in action. I don't know, maybe bank robbery or, or however you want to classify it. But it's it's I, damn near I, in a classify all its own. It's in a class all its own, really. Almost to tell you the truth. Now, was that in any way was that influenced by the Hollywood bank robbers that had the that, the armor? That happened, on? After. That happened, that happened after. after. Okay. Okay. That happened in 97. He came out in 95. Okay. All right. All right. I'd heard somebody say that, and I thought that that happened after the fact. Now, maybe maybe they were saying that the heat was an influence on it. I don't know. <laughs> influence them. Yes. Influence them. That might have been what it was. So They found the VHS. This is true. They found the, the VHS in one of the dude's v VCR at his house that wow. they killed. Wow. There were two of them. Yeah, the, the whole body armor shit, go yeah. in and just hunt for bear. And now, you've got an iconic line, or to me it's iconic, in that film. And I talk, we talked earlier, I had an interview earlier this year with Lilo Brancato Jr. And he said that was one of his most favorite lines of the movie and really in life. When you're realizing you're being watched by the feds and you're realizing that they're on to you, and so Robert's telling you guys, basically, you know, you got enough squirreled away, you should go away. And you just look at him and you're like, fuck it. You know, for me, the action is the juice I'm in. That is just such an iconic, the way you delivered it, plus the the tone and the setting that it was in. I mean, it was just fucking awesome. I agree. I, mean, I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> I did deliver it. Um, it's a great. I knew it when I read it. I was like, this line jumps out at you, you know? Yeah. Fuck it. The action is the juice. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> it's the juice. The, it's in the, you know, the fuck it and I'm in are great, but yeah. the action is. Yeah. Because that is why, well, the, it's not the only reason that Chorito's, Chorito's not going to, Chorito's going to do this with Neil because Neil needs it. I don't need it. Yeah. He tells, and I know I don't need it. I mean, but I know that he needs me to do the job. I mean, yeah, he can't do it by himself. And he, you know, we're a three man crew, or really a four man crew. With D Danny, Danny Trejo, Val, 
but we go in without me and Bob. Right. So, you know, he goes, you know, I, I go, he goes, he goes, we got to make our mind right. He goes, hey, we got to make our mind right now. You got to just, just accept this. They got us, you know, the feed, the FBI, LAPD sheriffs, whoever it is, they got us. We got to decide right now. Do we stay and take down the bank? Chris, oh, I need it, brother. I'm little, little, little. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, I go, my, I go, Michael, I go, I roll with you, Neil, whatever you want to, and you go, no, no, no. On this one, Michael, you're on your own. And I go, is this the best thing to do? I mean, do you think this is the best thing to do? Yeah. And he's not for you. It's not. He goes, he goes, oh, you know, if I were you, I mean, you got a lot put away. You got three kids. If I were you, I'd cut loose of this. Yeah. And he stops. And I go, okay, that's what you think. And I go, well, fuck it. The action is the juice. I'm in. I think the line works for me on two, two ways. It's like, it's, I do think that from talking to these kind of guys, we, we interviewed a bunch of guys who were in prison who did high end bank robberies like these guys. There's only there's not very many of them. There's a very finite number of these guys in prison in, in America at the time. And um, I remember they talked to these two guys um, separately, but they were they were in different prisons, but they were just, they, they were the same crew. Each of them had like 10 million bucks put away. They were clean. They were done. They were out of it. And they went back to another job and they got busted. And one of them killed a cop. And I said, I was with, I was with Bob. And Val wasn't at that. It wasn't at the morning session. We were went to. We were in. We were in. Um, Folsom, old, old Folsom, Folsom State Prison. Yeah. And um, Bob asked him, "Why did you do it? I mean, why would you do it? I mean, wasn't the idea to get a lot of money? You had a lot of money. He actually had. He was actually this guy had opened up dry cleaners in Connecticut and Massachusetts and had like seventeen. Had a chain. This bank robber, and so Bob's. So it was not the was not the the end game was to get money and why would you go back and risk your life again and and he said um well unless you go into unless you know what it's not I can't remember the words exactly but he said essentially said this until you walk into a bank with no money and walk out with fifteen million dollars with a high powered rifle and you're ready to get down all these guys were ex military all were ex rangers. Um, a couple, um, a couple of Delta Force guys. They're all ex-military, so these guys were prepared. These guys were trained, and so that's that's part of the, the jazz. But this guy said there was nothing that got him after he did this several times. There was nothing else that reached got him to this place he wanted to be. Yeah, he wanted to be high. there. You know, planning it. You know, planning it, organizing it, doing it, getting away with it. So he was basically said he was kind of addicted to it. Yeah. You know, there was no leaving it, you know, forever. And um, that was true of all the guys we talked to, you know. So that action is the juice. That's what it is. Yeah. The action, the action is, gets, is getting getting the hard on. It's, it's not the money. It's the action. Yeah. Money is part of the action, but it's not all the action. And that's true too. I, I interviewed a guy, um, Robert Fanaro. Now he's he was in The Irishman, and he he uh, had a couple of seasons in The Sopranos. And we had a conversation about gambling, and it's been my experience that it's not necessarily the money you win from a bet. It's just the idea of the mm -hmm. reason it's got you watching that game on a Monday or like last night. I. You know, the Cardinals or the Packers aren't my favorite team, but I'm watching that game because I got some money riding on the Cardinals, so it's got my interest in that game. Otherwise, I wouldn't really give a shit about who's playing. And it's not that money. It's just the rush of winning it. You know, it's, not the, it's not the money. It's, like you said, it's the rush for sure. I don't really gamble, but <clears throat> I, I, I can see well, that would be the, 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 the sex. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's that it's that point you're trying to get to. Now, and also, also losing is part of the hard on. I mean, yeah, like you could lose it all. Yes, and it's that risk. It's that that but feeling you, until I, it's you over. You're on high alert, man. You're like, boom, you're synced in, man, because it's all on this hand. Yeah, absolutely. Now, with that movie, you work with the creme de la creme of Hollywood. There, especially at the time, you're working with Val. You're working with Robert De Niro. You're working with Al Pacino. Did you have any, you, you didn't necessarily have any scenes with Al until he shot you, 
did you have a lot of conversations with him in the on the film or was he there a lot or how did that work because i understand if i'm and you can correct me if i'm wrong but the scene where neil and al actually talk at the diner they're not together that's that was filmed separately <laughs> i gotta say that <laughs> <laughs> They, they try to do it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that movie yeah. magic, man. In the fifth, I was using drugs, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> what what did you did you and <laughs> Al have any it's like eighteen years ago or some shit. Twenty years ago. <laughs> Did did you and Al have a lot of interaction on the set? We'll go back to the original question. Yeah, yeah. We, we 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 did to a point. You know, I was with Bob. You know, right. you were either with you were either kind of with Bob in more ways than one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You were with the you were with the criminals, and and Al was with the cops. I guess you could say. <laughs> I was I was a copper, and Bob was a, a bad guy. Now, Al, what is it like? I mean, he just seems like he is a presence unlike anybody I've probably ever met um, just seeing his own film persona. And even in that one, you know, he's got those times when he's talking to that girl, he's like, here, she's got a great ass. And I mean, he's just the way he's all the way up. Yeah. All I mean, just the way he delivers his lines is, is he like that outside of the character or outside of the film? Or is it, is it a little bit more laid back? How is he? He's much more laid back. Believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Although I've heard, I mean, I didn't see that aspect of his personality, but he likes to g play cards. He likes to gamble. Yes. And I, I does that a bit more of that, you know, you know, bigness that, that, that extrovert comes out, comes out. But, um, he's a real, he was, he's a real serious guy. He's, um, the thing about Bob and Al was really cool. They're real serious actors, but they're not like, weirdos or anything they're just sitting there with you and they go hey we're ready to go and they go and they do it man you know it's just yeah we're just really good at it yeah uh, <laughs> i mean good at it, man. scarface probably up there on my one of my all-time favorite movies for sure my top five for sure yeah what it, it what is your top five fun, might be the most fun performance i ever watched yeah the first time i watched it i was like wow this is bomb. <laughs> this dude is right on. What is Tom Sizemore's top five right now? I'm going to hit you with it. Movies or performances? Movies. Okay. <clears throat> Taxi Driver. Mm hmm. <laughs> I used to I used to have a real quick five and done this in a while. Taxi driver, deer hunter. Um, what's the Aronsky? They're an Aronsky movie with um, Jennifer Connelly and uh, Jared Leto. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. I don't know if it's in my top five. I like that movie a lot. Hang on, Taxi Driver, the Deer Hunter. Bonnie and Clyde? Yeah. Bonnie and Clyde? Mm-hmm. Bonnie and Clyde. Um, uh, it says, I really love Terms of Endearment, man. I mean, it's, it's, I just love that movie, man. I just, I've seen it a lot. Yeah. Um, Well, the first time I saw the third man, I okay, the deer hunter, taxi driver, um, um, the third man with Orson Welles, yeah, uh, and um, Bonnie and Clyde, and um, Cuckoo's Nest. One flew over to Cuckoo's Nest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are some good ones, man. Those are some classics. Well, for sure. Happy on. I mean, there's, there's some great movies, man. You know, there really are some oh, great yeah, movies. Yeah, it's hard to narrow narrow down. Come on. I take it back. The Godfather. I'm, I'm high. That's, yeah. <laughs> Hi, man. That's, I'm crazy. The Godfather is the greatest movie ever made. Yes. 
Yes. First one. The second one might be the second greatest movie ever made. Yeah, so, one one and two is one and two. Um, and then one I. Awfully fucking good, man. It's hard yeah. to beat those. Yeah, Goodfellas is up there for me. I'm a big, oh, huge Goodfellas uh, fan. Scorsese movie, oh, that's the driver. Yeah, Goodfellas. Come on, you got to be a top ten. I know there he is. Yeah. Well, he was just in two of the movies I said. I mean, The Deer Hunter. You probably haven't seen it lately. Oh, I've I seen it. it. Yeah. It's bro. Yeah. It's an intense it's scene. The the the. Uh, Russian roulette scene there at the end. That's that's pretty intense. Hmm? I said the Russian roulette scene there towards it. That's an intense scene. Fuck yeah, man! The movie's a trip. The movie's the movie holds up too. Yeah, yeah, still, still for sure. Um. Sure. So after Heat, I mean, obviously that's a that's a big you know success for you. Was it Saving Private Ryan the next big one? Yeah, that was the next movie. Yeah, the next movie you have. Now, earlier you alluded to around that time, you know, you had had some, some issues with some drugs. When did, I would say, your drug use start to become a little bit more than, than normal, than your recreational drug use? Um, right after Natural Born Killers. Right after Natural Born Killers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I'd clean up for a movie. Um, not used during the movie and then go back to it after. Right. And, uh, that was, um, that was my pattern for, until 1997. I got cast in that same private Ryan. And I, I got clean and I stayed clean until 2003, six years. Wow. And, uh, I, um, I fell back into it. I, I met a girl and uh, things just went fucked up. Things got really fucked up. Now, now speaking of girls, before we get in there, you are with probably one of the most famous women there is for a period of time there. You were with Heidi Fleiss for a period there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I got to ask. Use your, your imagination. It's all true. Yeah. <laughs> I got to ask, how did that meeting happen? Were you broker in another meeting? How did that happen? How did you two meet? How did we meet? Yeah. How did you two meet? Uh, the first time I met her was um, I was in a car and I was going to this club called um, oh fuck I can't remember the name of that club I was going with this guy uh, John Enos who was uh, an actor real good, Mickey Works best friend and he was friendly with her and he was meeting her at this club and we were going down um we were going down Highland and he said, oh, there she is. She drove a Porsche and he drove up to her and honked his horn and she rolled her window down. And I was in the passenger seat. She was right there. And uh, that's when I met her the first time. And um, that night at the club, at, at this, uh, this, this, what's the name of that club? Fuck. It's not one of the more famous ones. Um, but um, we really met at that club that night. And um, we, um, you know, that night. Wow. So that that kind of the night, the night I met her, the night we um we kind of got together. Yeah. So and and I'm sure it was she was still running her business at that time, right? No, nope, she just been released from prison. Oh, she had just got out from prison. Yeah. Okay. So the, and there was a lot of uh, I guess worry that she was going to release that black book when she was in trial. Yeah, but she never um, did. Did you? I, I don't know. To my knowledge, she never did. I don't know much about that. Um, I never saw it. Um, I don't even know if it really existed. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> she was never going to do that. Yeah. I, I, she didn't seem like the type that was going to do that. She was going to take what they gave her. And I mean, that's, I respect the fuck out of her for that. She took what they gave her. She done her time. And then she come out. She was like that. Yeah. She kept her mouth shut. And because uh, there were some, important important fools in that book oh yeah yeah i can imagine <laughs> a lot of people that probably were high up in echelon that did not want that information out for sure i would imagine yeah i mean she had cornered the market on uh wealthy successful men who were involved in that kind of 
behavior. Yeah. Well, Don Simpson was a big one. We actually just did an episode on him a few a few episodes ago, and he was a a big. I was tight with, I was tight with Don. Don was a fucking animal, man. <laughs> Don, Don was, he was crazy. Don, Don was a force of nature, bro. He lived like his fucking movies from everything that I've read. He was a force of nature. I was a good friend. I spent a lot of time with Don. Wow. Well, I mean, I can only imagine the fucking parties that he probably had. You know, he was, there was that aspect to it, but um, he was driven. He was, he was crazy, man. He was, he, he could do a lot of things. He was talented. He was smart. Um, and he burned it at both ends real hard. Yes. Yes, he did. And unfortunately, um, some people can do that and they can live to tell about it and live to give a, a testimony later on. And then some Not- can't. And I he, couldn't. Yeah, and he was not one that was able to to do that. And I hate it because he gave us, or at least you know, had a hand in giving us so many great films, especially action films for like guys who like movies. You know, guys, guys. Um, yeah. You know, he so good ones. Yeah, yeah. Him and Bruckheimer was the innovators of that shit for sure. Yeah. It's a big summer blockbuster. Um, you know, high concept movie. Um, yeah. They. They did that um, with Tony Scott. You know, they, they, they invented that. Don was, um, you know, if you'd have asked me back then, if I'd have been honest, I'd have told you that I, I would be concerned that Don wouldn't make it, that he might not be able to tell the tale later because yeah. he was so in it, you know, so intense. And he would try to clean up, <clears throat> but it never stuck. Yeah. There was a book that I read in prep for doing that episode, and it was called uh, You'll Never Make Love in This Town Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. read that book, too. Yeah, and he, he had some pretty wild uh, fetishes, <laughs> I guess you could say, in there. So, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in that, you can go back in our episode on Don Simpson and listen to that. So, um, really? Yeah, yeah. I think it was, I think it was the, it was two episodes ago. Two episodes ago, we did one. Cause I, he, he was always fascinating to me. I always heard his stories and I obviously was a big fan of his movies and, you know, he did days of thunder and days of thunder was actually filmed. I grew up in a town called Darlington, which is uh famous for their racetrack. And that's about it because there's nothing else there in that town and days of thunder come through there when they were filming. And that was where in the film, Tom Cruise won his first race as the NASCAR driver um, that he won his first race in Darlington. So that was like a huge deal for that little town. You know, they're filming a movie here. Tom Cruise is here. So, and my family's got some ties into racing and NASCAR. So that was always kind of one of my favorite movies growing up. And then I didn't realize till much later that he had a small cameo in the end of that yeah. movie. He wanted to have a bigger part from what I understood in some of my research. And even Tom was telling him like this, you're not going to be able to do it like this probably isn't for you. You just stick the behind the camera stuff. And, but he did get him a little cameo there at the very end of it. If you didn't know it was him, you probably wouldn't have know it, but. Right. I know. I know. Yeah. Um, Aldo Benedetti, I think was his name in the, in the, the cameo. What was it? <laughs> Aldo Benedetti. Oh. <laughs> they talked to him. Cause like after Cruz has his wreck and he comes back to race the last race at Daytona, they're talking to actual drivers. They're talking to like Harry Gant and some of the older guys that were actual drivers, I think uh, maybe Neil Bonnet might have been in there. I can't remember right off. But they go to this guy that I knew I didn't know because at that time I knew all the drivers. And I was like, I never heard of an Aldo Benedetti. And then I went and looked, you know, and I was like, oh, that's fucking Don Simpson. He's the damn director. Okay, that makes a little sense. But that was before you could just go on IMDb and, you know, find yeah. out anything and all that. And it wasn't all on the Internet. You, you still had secrets to keep back then. You could do stuff on the slide. Nobody knew. <laughs> Hey, hey, wait, <clears throat> I'm getting tired. Can, can we continue this tomorrow? Yeah. Because I'm having a lot of fun. But no, I, I am getting... too, man. And I, I mean, I was about to try to wrap it up, but I mean, like, I, 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 if you're cool with that, we can pick it up tomorrow. Let's pick it up tomorrow. Okay. I, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm just tired. Yeah, yeah. So, uh,